All righty, folks. Welcome back to the Mushing Alaska's coverage of the 2024 Iditarod. I'm your host, or one half of your hosts, Brendan, and super excited to be here with you all today. Uh, yesterday, we had a, a chance to have Riley on, and I felt like we had a really good discussion, especially a lot of good chats, questions that came in. So keep that up, those of you who are tuning in. Before I introduce our next guest, I do want to just take a quick second to give a shout out to one of our viewers cat from idaho is what i believe uh she sent me this red lantern here in in the background she thought it would be a cool addition for the set here the set i say in like quotations but um i just thought that was really sweet cat thank you so much for that addition um i put your magnet up but i think that the cat got it and it fell down so uh, I'll make sure it's up for the next one. Uh, the second thing I wanted to real quickly plug and give a shout out to is the insider. Uh, within that, I want to give a shout out to my brother. I think he's doing a great job, man. He is making the right, he, right from what I can tell that he's done so far is he's manning the cameras at checkpoints, but he's also sitting there providing information about what you're looking at. And I don't know, I haven't been a part of the insider for very long, but in years past for me, I was just kind of watching a checkpoint and being like, ah, I'm not that interested. So I want to give a shout out to him. Katie Joe is killing it on the interviews too. Um, and just really wanted to give us a chance to like kind of promote the insider. Again, we're kind of supplemental to what they're doing. We're just giving you access to the people that we have on that are going to break down the race. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. He is a 10... I, I, it excites me to say this, a 10-time Iditarod veteran. He is the recipient of the prestigious Herbie Naok Pack Award. His insights and experiences are going to be amazing today, and I am super w excited to welcome you on. Thanks for coming on, Aaron. How are you doing today? Yeah, and uh, just a quick shout out to you, you know, uh, when I asked you about the idea of coming on, you know, this is a couple months ago, I guess, when we recorded our, our podcast. Um, oh, you know what? There we go. Um, when I asked you to come on, I don't, did you know you were going to be in Switzerland at the time? Um, I think at that very moment, it had escaped my mind, but I... I, I thought regardless, like, you know, we're just tuned in over here. To, I mean, there's we're not remote by any means. So I didn't think it would be an obstacle, really. So, Gotcha, gotcha. Well, thank you so much for joining in. And uh, before I give any opinions about anything that I've been observing, I'm very curious. We're getting into our, like, 24-hour mandatory break. Some people are in it. Some people are about to be in it. Where's your head at? What are What are you seeing that's grabbing your attention? Well, first off, yeah, I've got the, you know, you get the itch to be out there when the race was starting. It was all exciting, you know, and I, I'm like the dog that got left behind this year and howling away in the empty dog yard. But, um, yeah, it's now that they're into this part, I, I can just kind of feel it. You know, I really feel what, you know, how, how tired they can be at this point. Um, there's been hardly any sleep for the front runners and, and coming into the 24, it's like going into those, the middle of the night uh is when a lot of them are pulling over and they're just you know mentally geared up for that that rest that's just just ahead of them they can just at some point they're just able to crash down and and get as big as well they gotta they gotta measure their sleep still even on the 24 and and it's not like you can just pass out for 12 hours there's a lot of work to do but you can get your dogs initially looked after cared for get a meal into them and then have a serious sleep which for, could be four hours could be five hours for a musher and the dogs and the musher just get that chance but the race as far as uh the competition i mean it's it's exciting uh there's as i see it there's kind of three different three different strategies of top five mushers unfolding in front of us here and it's kind of um you know you got that core group sticking to the conventional to cotton uh, plan the t the 24 to cotton which is such a tried and true race plan um it's kind of a no fail 
or a, 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 a less chance of, of, of having risk. There's less risk in that plan by 24 and into Cotna than uh, Jesse Holmes has been executing the Brent Sass plan. If you watched uh, when Brent Sass beat uh, Dallas um, a couple of years ago there, um, that, that, that uh, Jesse Holmes is, it was attempting that plan. Exactly. He did it last year. Um, it didn't fully work out, but now he's tried it again and it hasn't quite materialized as well. Although he's still in the race, he's still in that position where he could win this thing, but he's had to all, he, he's had to diverge from that plan that, uh, he was, he was going for. That's pretty clear. And then, um, we can go into those further details. Um, and then Dallas CV has, um, you know, he, he could have done the Takatna, but, um, he held up in McGrath and once he did that, like, which he's done before he's, he's going to cripple and he's, he's now we have the benefit, you know, yesterday at this time, uh, is still a lot of speculation. We have the advantage right now of not speculating. We can definitely see what's, what's happening here. So that's where in the, we get that luxury now. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that I did in preparation for today um, was I was I didn't have time to break everyone down, but I took just the top two lists. As as of this recording, we've got Dallas uh, resting outside of Ofer, mile three sixty three, with Jesse Holmes in Ofer at mile three fifty two. And so I, before we came on, just broke down the run rest schedule, and there was one thing that I saw that was kind of interesting on Jesse's part and that was he did this eight hour run but when I went back and watched it on the tracker like the actual replay of it he got to about five and a half hours into that run and he was in the lead and then you know some of the front of the pack came up and it became only like a 10 minute break and then he added another three three hours on and and I just thought that was interesting. I guess is it is that like just a normal ten minute break, or do you think maybe he saw the front of the pack? It was like, ah, eh, maybe I should keep it going. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, how, where was that exactly? Where were you observing? What part of the trail was that? That was, I think it was going from McG uh, McGrath to Takatna, if I recall. So it okay. was. Okay. So. Yeah. Ahead. What. Yeah, what what Jesse um, the the idea behind Brent Sass's um, strategy that won him the Iditarod, and then last year I twenty four with Jesse Holmes last year and Brent Sass, and you know it's like, but Jesse said you know he's like I'm just gonna copy what Brent did. I'm gonna do exactly what Brent did, and I'm just gonna give her and take the risk and jump off the into the deep end and and let her rip and see how it plays out, and that's what he did. Last year, he he got some feet issues with some dogs mid over towards the river. He was first to the river last year, but so this year doing the same thing. What he wanted to actually do um, is is get part way to McGrath from Nikolai, and then he would have been a good run over to Ofer to take his twenty four. But if you watch his interview on the Insider, he admits there exactly what I was thinking is that wasn't going too hot leaving Nikolai or it was hot and the trail was soft and he's seeing red flags and he hit the deck and pulled over. He didn't rest long, but he knew he had to pull over. And then that blew his chance of getting to Ofer in one run from there. So then he knew he had to stop again in McGrath. So I think what I'm not sure. It may there, have been I the, think um, it may have yeah. been the run before that, that I saw it. Um, out of Nikolai or into Nikolai, but I just thought it was interesting. I'm like, you know, he came off of a, what was it? A kind of a longer run. And then he, I was like, okay, so he's going to take a five hour break here. And then it turned in or a, a, a five hour run. And then it turned into an eight hour run. And I just was like, I don't wonder if that was part of the original plan or not. So, um, but uh, both Jesse and, uh, Dallas have done seven runs and they are pretty much equal in terms of run times to rest times. The math I did had um, Dallas at 40, 
42 hours of run and Jesse at 39 hours of run, but then the rest were all, almost identical, 23 hours. So they're pretty close, even though they're running a different type of race. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, on the trail, Jesse's got to offer ahead of Dallas. Um, the difference there and run, you know, Jesse has spent less time actually running because he's running faster um, overall since the start. I think Jesse's speed has been top shelf, like leading the race in terms of miles per hour, moving, moving speed. Um, Dallas uh, kind of middle average there because he, he does the whole, you know, he's carrying dogs at times when he can, when the trail allows it. It's a more conservative style of running. He's not uh, like, Jesse Holmes, interestingly, uh, went without a caboose. Uh, you know, the sit down part on the back of the sled, which is a surprise to see that's, um, why is that? You know, it's a lot more time standing. You're not able to rest your legs here and there. I think he's determined in his mind and maybe he's proven it in training somehow that that's, uh, allowed his speed. You know, I've heard it said from other mushers that a switch back for this or that reason, it can actually grab a little speed back. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be so interesting to really test. All everybody's gone to the sit down sled. That's a that's a standard Iditarod sled. To see somebody without the seat behind them is unique and rare and unconventional. And Brent Sass has done quite a bit of it, but um Jesse's got, you know, he's he's going the race without a sit down, which is for a reason in his mind. Sure. Do you think there's an element of uh like other mushers see that and they're like, dang, he means business or is there like uh like psychology behind that? Or is you think he's just like this, that's just how he prefers to do it. Well, Jesse is an athlete. He's an ultra runner and you can see him coming in and Nikolai, he's still ski pulling. He works like a bugger on the sled and that allows him to kick more efficiently. He probably likes um, to kick in the center while he's pulling on the outside. And you can get into a nice rhythm there, like um, your cadence with your pull and kick and pull and kick and pull and kick. You can't do that when your seat is there. So, um, you know, by him contributing to the team, he could be throwing a half mile an hour, uh, half a mile per hour speed onto that team, taking pressure off the team, saving energy in his team. And it's pretty smart, actually, if you're willing to um, put yourself out there like that. Uh, physically sure and so let me ask you uh that on that same note uh what is your opinion of the polling and the kicking is that uh something that you're into do you do that normally or are you trying to save some energy out there um shot oh. and i've kind of gone back and forth on that before okay uh i froze there for a minute was that all right did that show up you're fine. I think that my jibber jabber may have covered up your fr frozen aspect of things. W were you able to catch my question? <laughs> no, go repeat it, please. Yeah. Uh, I was just asking your opinion on the polling and kicking aspect. You know, I, I see some mushers doing it. I see some mushers not doing it. Can you kind of just give your opinion on that? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time pulling and kicking and breaking my arm and breaking my leg. Like, I mean, I guess, and I don't want to say I'm an old musher or anything, but I've, I've done a lot less of it in the last few years. I think the better my dog team is, the less I feel the need to do it. And the more conservative minded I am about running Iditarod, like just the whole mental approach being relaxed and just easy. I don't, I don't want to, get all intense and worked up there's a time to work on the sled and that'll be more uh later in the race um or if the conditions i mean if you're in a really tough spot and you've got a a dog in the sled and now you're weighted down and you really then you got to really engage at that point and get to work but if everything's going good and you're kind of i you know i raced in the wyoming stage stop for several years you know and that's where i really learn to work on the sled and that was part of my success there was just the physical aspect of it on my part helping my team and you can't carry that intensity into Iditarod as far as I'm concerned and I I almost see mushers that are ski pulling and and working themselves 
into a sweat out there i i don't i don't think it makes a lot of sense and i don't think because when you have the seat when you sit down on that seat you're you're getting out of the wind and i know there were certain mushers in the wyoming stage stop and they're looking at their gps as they're flying down the trail and they kick and they're looking at the gps and then they then they tuck out of the wind and they look at the gps and they're like well I'm actually helping them more by just getting out of the wind because some, I don't think mushers realize how much resistance they're putting on the dogs just by standing there and all the wind, especially you put up your big fur rough and now you're like a wind sail going against that, you know, as you're going 10 miles an hour down the trail, you're, you're creating drag. I think a lot of the times, if you just sit down, get out of the way and tuck your head down, if you can, or at least you don't have to tuck, at least you're reducing that drag by a lot i think that's just as beneficial as kicking for the most part and i think it's conserving your energy so you have it later to take care of the dogs that's my opinion okay so there's for you there's a time and a place but you're not doing it throughout the race and mm-hmm. you know maybe as you've gotten as you're as you've uh gotten wiser Per, per se is the right word there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say you got oh, older, yeah. just wiser. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I have, we, we had a question the other day that I didn't get around to asking, and I, I was hoping that you could provide some insight on this one. It comes from one of our viewers, Leroy. He asked dogs. He saw, he noticed the dogs are rubbing their noses and their faces in the snow as they come into like checkpoints and just was curious, like, what's that all about? Well, I, I think it's meant, it's just, um, I think mentally the dogs are, uh, getting the signals that it's rest time. I think they're, they love, um, diving in the snow and sometimes they chomp at the snow cause they're hot and they want to cool down. And I mean, they're just rolling around in the snow. I think it just feels good to them. I think they're just, I, I don't know. Some dogs do, some dogs don't. I think it's just that in, that initiation of hey it's rest time. I mean they're looking they're kind of excited over the straw and the food and it's just kind of that's part of it. Um, if you stop out there on the trail where people don't get to see, you know, the dogs will hit the snow and dive into the the deep snow and roll around there too. So it's not maybe not associated with the rest signal all the time, but uh, I think it's just dogs being dogs. They just want to roll around in that snow and maybe rub off some of those icicles off their face. Okay. Yeah, no, I I uh I've noticed that before. I've not thought of like asking that, but uh, you know, anytime someone asks a good question, I'm a question whether it's good or not or whatever, I want to ask it. So, um so I want to talk to you a little bit about mindset with the 24 hour, right? So, <clears throat> um I feel like there are different ways people attack the 24, right? Like there it could be the approach of all right, you know, you got your 24 hours. So maybe you like kind of run them a little bit longer than what you've been doing into that. Right. Um, But then maybe there's also like, well, I want, I want my dogs in good shape going into the 24. So that way they truly benefit from it. So I'm just kind of curious if you can kind of talk a little bit more about that. Well, the, most common Iditarod strategy that you've seen take place here and every other year is, you know, it's uh, landing on Nikolai, hopefully before noon, before the heat of the day, rest there. If you're really at the front of the pack, you're going to depart Nikolai in the heat of the day. And you're going to have a hot run over, but it's, it's, that's uh, normally you wouldn't go past McGrath. And that's why you see Dallas stop there. It's because he knows like he's not, 24 and in Dakota, so there's no sense pushing it over to Dakota. but it's that that's just the right amount of extra that you might want to put on going into the 24 is that extra two hours over to Dakota after McGrath and that's it's just about right that's why it's so common for teams to just go from uh, Dakota. they get that little extra down the trail um knowing the dogs are going to have plenty of time to recover from that little extra you've taken out of them to get over there. And it just sets you up. You're just, uh, you know, that extra 20 miles closer down the trail. And so, yeah, any competitive musher, if you're not competitive, it's not going to matter. Just um, time of day is a big consideration too. Um, Part of Jesse Holmes 
decision to hold up in McGrath the way I mean he rested after Nikolai and he wanted to go further he admitted it and it's obvious he wanted to go further and get to over in one run but he now he stopped just after Nikolai then he had to stop again in McGrath but he he maybe could have it would have been too far but what what he did by he only rested three and a half hours in McGrath because he'd only run for five but what that did it set him up uh in Olfer to land on Olfer at like what's he going to leave there he's going to be leaving after his 24 if my calculation might be off by just a bit but it's around 5 18 a.m that he's going to be able to depart that's the perfect time to depart after your 24 so you got to think about that whereas uh travis who's the first one into Dakota, he is going to depart i i've got him at 10 47 departing to Kotna p.m so he's he's kind of on the wrong end of that he's running into the wrong type of schedule compared to jesse holmes um however when you're racing at the front of the pack inevitably you're going to run in the heat of the day and inevitably you're going to run in the witching hours of the night it's hard to avoid it but if you can a seven you know a seven hour run for jesse coming out of five 518 departure he's going to run till noon coming off his 24 which is perfect you know and he's going to have a heat of the day rest after that first run off his 24 which is exactly what you want to accomplish if you can coming off your 24 so that's a consideration for your 24 as well um yeah uh i've seen in the past uh i remember one year jeff king and and uh, Zach Steer, I think it was, they ran Nikolai all the way to Ofer in one big run. It was good trail and um, didn't benefit. I mean, maybe they zapped them a little bit too much, but I mean, people have tried that to go even further, an extra two or three hours past to Kotna to Ofer to go into their 24. So I think people have realized to Kotna is just the right distance. And can you speak to the Takatna check? Like, what is it about Takatna that, like, I guess most of the winners usually 24 out do their Mando in Takatna? Like, is there a rhyme or reason as to why Takatna is, you know, where 90% or more of the winners stop at? I think that just lays into the percentage of teams that take their 24 hour in to Kotna. And, um, I guess it's a, um, it's the, it's the safest place. Um, you get the benefit of letting others go off ahead and break that trail out to the halfway point. Cause there's every year, there's always somebody that goes for it, you know, that wants to go out there or that the great unknown, like that's like, and you're out there. I mean, and you can ask to try to get trail conditions, trail reports, but when you're a musher out there, you're not getting much information as to what, is it going to be a firm base out there after Ofer, or is it going to be a soft wind drifted, like mess of a trail? And that's the big gamble. It's like, how's it going to be? And, um, the one year, uh, the gold loop year, I went to Iditarod for the 24. And so that was going off after over. And I, I had a good trail. I thought, oh, we, we did it good. You know, we hit it right. But then the way the temperatures lined up and the teams coming after, like we we set it up for them. Even It, it turned into a luge run behind us. Um, it, we thought it was good, but it got a lot better for the teams behind us. And they made up huge time coming over to Iditarod for the, after they had taken their 24 in McGrath or over or whatever. So it, it just can go either way. You might get to run on that crust on top. Dallas might get this perfect trail up to cripple right now. It's hard to say. And then it might break apart. That top crust layer might start breaking apart. Um, weather could come through and, uh, drift it across in different places a lot of open country there there's a lot of potential for it that trail to go real screwy and um so it's hard to say who's going to benefit from this right now um so can you talk a little bit about you know we you've got dallas heading to cripple he's on a rest right now and then you've got uh the folk uh the folks that are heading to ofer and stuff is there anything that that people watching would help them to know about the terrain there what are they up against are they climbing mountains in this area are they going through the woods what's it like in these these going in and out of these couple checkpoints that we're at right now 
So the run from Nikolai over to McGrath is flat. It's okay. uh, easy going. You got rivers and tundra muskegs, and you're on and off the river. It's flat. I don't. There's a couple steep pitches getting off the river. Whatever. It's flat. After McGrath, it's flat again. Halfway to Takana. Then you start getting into the hills, and now you're climbing. It's slowing down, and then you crest the hill, and you can see the lights to Cotna off in the distance, and now you've made it. Like, it's just now a downhill glide, cruise control into Takatna. But once you leave Takatna, now you climb like a bugger, and it's up a very well-trafficked. Uh, there's cabins and, and homesteads up there and where people live near Takatna, and that's a beat-down trail. It's like a road. In the summer, it would be a road, so it's really wide, and you, you just slowly you know now you're kicking and helping and easing your way up this long ass hill and you finally get over that bugger and then you're now it's cruise control all the way down to over because now you've peaked it's very rugged topography after Takatna for a while like the hills i got to see it in the daylight one year and it's just massive steep topography on the west side of Takatna. and then um you follow that road, that old gold mining road there. So it is a legitimate summertime road, I believe, to Cotton over to Ofer. And so the trail is on that road. So you're kind of a long uh, downhill grade into Ofer. And then you start seeing a lot of old uh, from the gold mining and just different old wreckage and buildings and machinery and just old stuff there and you kind of know you're getting close to the checkpoint at that point and you go over some old bridges there's some old bridges and some of them watch out if they don't have much snow on there and stuff and and then um yeah that's that's the trail over to Ofer. um so yeah there is some big climbs in there but there's some also long downgrades to enjoy as well where you can kind of relax a little bit more so and then uh so like dallas he's once he uh, gets going, let's see. He took a rest at at seven fourteen, so he's still got probably a few more hours before he takes off. But he's gonna head to Cripple. What's that? What's that? Um, that route look like for him and and the folks behind him? Yeah, you leave in the bush for a while, and there's an airstrip, and then you get to the the split where the trail heads to the southern route or the northern route. There's a sign there that clearly defines that. So you start heading north. And um, you get into some open country before too long. And uh, that one year, trail was drifted in real bad. What year? That was 20, um, 2022, 2022, I think. That was the year I was 10th. I remember uh, uh, Riley, Richie Deal had to break a lot of trail going up through that stretch. And then I it was drifted in again for the next team. But it was like tough slugging. And I was like, holy shit. Like, this is this is going to be a hell of a run if we got to deal with this. And then, but thank goodness it got a little better. A lot of open country going up to cripple, a lot of wind drift. You can have cross winds drifting over the trail. Some spots there's protection. I mean, I remember seeing Pete Kaiser camp, you know, you know, part, you know, exposed in the wind. It was the worst camping spot I thought ever, you know, if you just went a couple more miles, you'd have been out of the wind in the bush. But so you get these little, you know, spots where you get some protection here and there but there's a lot of open country up to cripple and it's kind of the run that's why historically you've got teams turn around before they get to cripple because they think they're lost because it just goes on for bloody ever and um yeah it's <laughs> if you watch some of the old iditarod videos you got like teams coming backwards paul gebhardt i think and uh somebody else has turned around before they got to cripple and uh, yes. completely um like convince themselves that they had missed the checkpoint because they've been running for so long trying to get there and so yeah cripple is like an illusion this you know this mirage out in the distance and you can never it's just but if they get a good trail i mean it's you can get there in fine fashion but it's a it's a high risk run for sure 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 i mean and that's you know over to cripple is 73 ish miles is that is that right does that sound right to you yeah it's it's a, historically a 10 11 hour travel time right so dallas has um in order to stay competitive i think he's got to make it to cripple in this next run but it's i think it's beyond where he's comfortable running i think he's going to extend into his red zone if he's going to try to go all the way to cripple. Now he's camped very rarely would a team camp twice in one stretch. I mean, he's just carried straw out of over and he's used it 
Now, what if he wants to camp again before he actually gets to Cripple and to avoid putting this, what could be a, a great big, you know, I don't know how many how many hours he's left over, but a couple hours. So he might still have eight hours to get to Cripple. Could be an eight hour run. Um, But his team is fast. I mean, they're strong. I mean, he's got a big, he's, he can, obviously the dogs can do it. It's what, but it's that line that he never crosses, you know, and other, it, it's kind of this uh, seven hour red line. And um, yep. you'll very seldom see Dallas run beyond seven hours. Yeah, and he already has two runs. His fourth run was shy of seven hours, and his his most recent run to his where he's rested at now was also a seven hour run. So yeah. uh, that'll be very interesting to see what happens. You know, um, I I have to think that with his hauling of the dogs, he's gonna pull that run off, and it should be not too bad for him um maybe not as bad as maybe others that aren't hauling dogs do you have any comments on that so dog hauling is such an interesting dynamic to investigate and i have gone deep into that investigate i've i've hauled dogs to a certain extent on iditarod and built a caboose and it's kind of you'll see travis beals is doing it and dallas is doing it i don't know if anyone else is doing it it's 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 a it's a debatable controversial thing but it's like hauling dogs um you do the math on you know those dogs are riding in that trailer i don't know if they're getting real REM sleep but they are getting time off their feet and the more they're used to it in training the more they do probably you know rest um very well in there if it's a comfortable built trailer with straw in there and and um yeah so depending on the trail conditions determines how many dogs he's carrying dallas i believe can carry up to four dogs at a time i don't know about travis but uh dallas's own body size helps that a lot you know some of us that are a little bigger you know we almost have uh you know um dallas can carry a 40 pound dog probably and then be uh, around the same weight as me like or other mushers that are bigger than me you know it's like well so, but that's the idea, Rob. We don't we don't want to bitch and complain about those things like that. It's just it's just giver. It's it's the wild west, and we like it that way. So we're not going to complain about who's bigger and smaller. But, um, anyways, dog carrying. Like I found when I was carrying dogs out of the start. Um, what year was it? Um, yeah, 2022. I got, I was fortunate enough to start right near Dallas, you know, and it wasn't even, we, we were still in the willow swamps and he was pulling over to start loading dogs. Cause you can't leave the starting line with them. Right. And then, and then I stopped a little bit after and loaded two dogs. I, I was not going to carry more than two dogs and like clockwork, you know, then we're out on the river, he's pulled over again and he's rotating those dogs in and out. I was blown away to see him have a couple loose dogs around his sled that were just so used to getting in and out. They were like, it was um, something I'm like, holy shit, buddy, don't lose your dog. Like that's kind of risky out here. <laughs> There's teams going, I'm, I went right by him. I passed him and he's there with his dogs. I'm like, holy cow, if they want to pull the hook chasing after me and you've got a loose dog, I mean, it looked pretty, but he totally knew what he was doing and very, you know, he's the best in the world at it. So but it was like we leapfrog all the way up to Yentna and just stop on the same, you know, it was like a 45 minute time lapse, you know, he'd stop and I'd stop, he'd stop that, you know, and you pass him and then he'd pass and we were just getting passed by all these teams. But it was like playing that patient, conservative um, strategy, loading those dogs and carrying those dogs and putting rest on those dogs. I mean, if a dog could, I can't whiz the math off the top of my head right now, but if you if you think later in the race on the coast, if you've got a dog that has traveled 100 or 200 miles less in the first third of the race because he's been you know been riding in the sled, it means he's got more fuel in the tank for the last part of the race. And so that dog really is running like a seven or eight hundred mile race and not a thousand mile race. So it could equate into a half mile an hour more speed on the coast. Um, and there's so many different ways to break this down, but um depends how far you want to go into it <laughs> all right well um we i mean we kind of talked a little bit about that with riley yesterday um but i just kind of wanted to get your perspective on that um 
Now, one thing that I've been hearing a lot of in the insider videos is a lot of sugary conditions. And I would love for you to speak a little bit more about sugary conditions and, you know, like, how do you, do you have to kind of alter a little bit of your style of, of how you attack that run when you're, you know, got that sugary, more fluffy stuff that you got to work through versus something that's packed down for you that you can just go right over? Yeah. So in training, we, I mean, there's been times when I did a rod, you get into trail conditions that just blow your mind and you're thinking like every dog on my team is going to be hurt from running through this, this snot, you know, this sugary trail, like big wallow holes, like stuff you would never take them through in training. And all of a sudden you're fully committed. And it's just like, it takes like faith. Like you just have faith in the dogs and you just, they're just piling through this, these obstacles and the trail and these wallows, these soft holes that like have been punched out because the crust has been broken through. And now you've got a big hole in the trail and you basically got to jump off your sled because you're worried you're going to snap your runners because the sled goes down through it and you got to kind of skirt around the outside. And, but yeah, the dogs, um, you're just watching and you're just praying to God, they're going to hold up and get through and they continue to get through and you're just, you build confidence and like, wow, they can really handle this. It's amazing how they can handle this. And, you know, maybe it takes the odd dog out with the shoulder injury here and there, but it's very, I mean, they're, they're capable of so much. And even you would think at this point when they're, you know, um, a little more tired, I guess, than they are typically training at home and they have to go through some of these tough trail conditions, but it's just incredible what they can handle. And yeah, it's just when you're out there and you're just cringing your teeth and just, Oh my goodness. Wow. Like, yeah. And they get through it over and over. And you just, I think the first third of the race is probably the worst for that. It'll get better. Okay. So you like at what, what, where is a checkpoint generally that maybe things kind of get more favorable for that? I, I have found like you, you go through those mountains, eh? And you break through, um, the farewell lakes and there's a whole bunch of these hills up and down up and down and they're they're a bugger and then you get over the last one and you get this incredible view north and it's like this long straight drive trail towards Nikolai that just goes as far as the eye can see and you um that's usually a sigh of relief because now I'm I'm out of the mountains and like that's I think where the trail can improve greatly it's like you're officially into the interior you'll have colder temps and um yeah, that's that's where you'll see the trail really um, improve once you get up into the interior, and you're 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 out of all that craziness, and it's been like such a toll on the body and the dogs and the windiness and the glare ice and the tussocks and the dirt and the gravel and the, it's just oh on and on and on. You're just getting hit right, left, and center like smacked around and you're just so beat up and you get that view up and then once you're up in that and then you turn around and look behind you and you see the alaska range behind you and you that's where i usually take a picture because it's mm. just incredible it's like oh yeah like we just made it through that like look at those mountains you always see them from the south side right like when you're in the willow area and you see all the mountains from the south side and then you turn around from the north and you look and you see them from the entire opposite direction and it's like Holy shit. We just did it. Mm. That's so cool. It's such a cool thing. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, so I wanted to ask a question in relation to the sugary conditions. So just hypothetically, we're like all things being equal that you don't have to talk about a certain race or a certain checkpoint to checkpoint. But if you let's say you have a 50 mile run, right? And you have mm -hmm. um, favorable mushing conditions where the snow is nice and packed down and maybe the terrain is mostly flat that five hour or that 50 mile run is going to maybe generally be done in like five hours give or take is that right i always add an extra i say if it's 50 miles on a good nice trail it's going to take 60 because i'm really there might be times we're doing 10 miles an hour but realistically we're doing nine or eight and a half realistically and what's really interesting is like 
every musher is different. You know, how often are you snacking? How often are you stopping? Like stop, give them a mental break, a pee break, a snack break, uh, untangle some lines. Um, all these breaks, you know, when you start using a GPS and it starts, if you have it on the setting where it's keeping track of your stop time, it's easy to have like a whole, like 45 minutes of stop time in a five hour, six hour run of stop time. So that means, um, but if some mushers just try to, you know, get there as quick as they can and they're avoiding stops as much as possible because they, they're, they're considering that more They're Yeah. I mean, so yeah, add an extra hour, at least a 50 okay. mile run is six. And then as the race, it, it can become a seven hour run to do 50 miles, uh, generally if you're trying to do some math in your head. Right. And, and so, but like I, my follow up to that is like, if it's uh sugary, what normally is a six or seven hour run becomes like a seven or eight oh, hour run or, or even 10, more. Could be 10. Could be okay. 10. If it's bad enough. Yeah. I mean, be ready. I mean, yeah. If you're just wallowing out there, like they, it sounds like if you look at the trail times coming into McGrath, um, the trail got worse. Um, the early teams were fast. That's partly because they're stronger teams, but there's some other strong teams coming later that had seven hour trail times coming over to McGrath. And uh, in one group of mushers, if you look at um, Jeff Dieter, uh, who's got an incredible dog team. And I think he's been, he's going to start benefiting now from the extra rest he's taken earlier in the race. And there he has a six and a half hour trail time when all the teams around him had seven hour trail times. That's a key indicator that he's got a super strong team that's going to be ready to roll in the second half of the race. But a seven hour trail time from Nikolai to McGrath is slow. That's slow going. It should only take six hours. Like the first trail times were like um, Travis. I think he was just over six hours. He had the best trail of them all. And after that, it got worse and worse. And then you'll see all those trail times slowing down. That's evidence of a cross breaking apart. And then you hear, you watch the videos and people, then people are like, okay, I can't make it to Tacotten. It actually affects their strategy. And, you know, you got Matt Failer uh, as an example, who pulled over in McGrath and he wanted to go to Tacotten for his 24, um, but realized it wasn't in the best interest. So he takes his rest in McGrath and now he's popping over to over. It wasn't his plan. And he admitted it there on the video and uh, he made a wise cho choice, I think there. So, but um, he's given some time away. He would have been better positioned uh, going after the 24, if he could have made it to Takatna, but he, he, he didn't feel that was the best thing for his team because of that slow, hard run over yep. to McGrath. Yep. Flat trail, but tough going. I'm glad that you brought up uh, Jeff because I was watching one of the videos uh, a little bit earlier on where he, it seemed like he was a little bit disappointed. He had his plan A, his plan A wasn't going according to plan. Uh, the dogs weren't doing uh, well. I think he said they weren't eating that well and it was, you know, going through the sugary stuff. Um, so I'm, I, 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 when I watched that, I was like, oh boy, I know that they were hoping to, you know, be competitive. And so, I'm glad that you brought that up. That 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 sounds like the dogs are recovering from that. You know, I think it was the first 250 miles that just did not go as Jeff had planned. There's there's two mushers that I can think of. I wrote them down off the top of my you know that are in that category right now, and that are going to be like killing it after the 24. And one is Jeff Dieter, and he was down and out. Rainy pass and down on his luck and not feeling good and mentally um i've been there man i've been in rainy pass thinking my race is over and it it sucks and not that he was there he wasn't even close to think i mean he was just had some issues the other one if you watch Paige strobney's interview in rainy pass she was also down not feeling very good it's that your first like punch across the chin of being tired you're just like it's starting to just set in and she was a little discouraged but do you see her moving now my goodness like she is roaring up the trail her run from mcgrath she overtook burmeister left jesse royer in the dust both of them she had some of the fastest trail time over to takatna i mean they have well-bred dogs they train in that same area they live up where in the mountains there where um, jesse holmes is that's a tough as hell team i mean 
and they're a younger team that they don't really know what they're capable of. But the reason, like she said, and you know, they signed up because they saw the potential in this group of dogs and they weren't initially going to run, but they thought, how can we not run with this great group of young dogs? And I think she's going to have a strong, cause she knows how to be in the top 10. She's finished seventh place twice. Yep. She knows how to do it. And if she's got the right team in front of her, she'll be right in there. And I like what I see with her and Jeff. Uh, I think they are um, two teams to really watch out for in the second half of the race. Nice. That's, that's great feedback right there. I want to real quickly uh, bring in a question from one of our viewers. This is from R Hill 66. He's from Alaska. He is uh, he kicks sleds short distance with a small team currently. And he's interested in upgrading his sled. So that's kind of his mindset. The question, though, was where do mushers get their custom sleds from? And do they build their own or do they hire custom builders in Alaska or elsewhere? Well, some of us build our own sleds for two reasons. One, we're too cheap to go out and buy a real nice sled. And the other reason for building our own sled is when you build it yourself, you know how to fix it. And you know every little bolt that you put into that thing. And it's something to really be proud of too. I mean, a sled I built myself has carried me through um, every, not 2018, but 19 onwards till just last year was, you know, a sled that I built myself. And, you know, I love that sled because I built it. You know, it's not the best sled. It's not the lightest sled, but it's tough as hell. Like it's been through, you can't break it. And, uh, you know, um, but to be, to go buy an Iditarod quality sled, your best bet is Prairie Built Sleds. Big plug for them. They're actually wonderful people. And uh, Prairie Built Sleds in North Dakota. And they, they build a hell of a sled. There's there's probably some of their sleds in the race. And there's some other sled builders too um, out there that um, like the Gott sleds are, they you know, a good portion of the sleds have been Hans Gott sleds because, you know, he's a Iditarod almost winner Yukon quest winner he's like meticulous and build beautiful sled. like pete kaiser's using a got sled and richie deal's always using a got sled and i think uh yeah there's there's a bunch of them out there on the trail but uh he's not building sleds anymore so i mean there's some other good sled builders out there you just have to dig around but yeah did you did you see the video where Dallas was talking about he built his own recently out of carbon fire fiber? Yeah, that's cool. Um, oh, um, what's his name? He's not running this year. Lev Schwartz. Yep. Uh, I did a rod veteran. Yep, yep. Great guy. He's a craftsman. Like that guy's a mill. I forget his trade, a millwright or whatever. Like he builds shit out of carbon fiber like he built these ladles out of carbon fiber that have some of the mushers i still use mine it's the most lightweight durable ladle for feeding your dogs but he then builds a sled out of carbon fiber and he brings me over as in mcgrath 24 and he's like come on come look at this like gotta show you this sled and like and he's he's kind of nervous about it because he hasn't like used it yet the thing like i pick it up with my baby finger and he's like feel that it's like it's light as it's like under 30 pounds and it's like an iditarod uh caliber type sled it's all built out of carbon fiber i'm like what if it busts apart like how do you know and he's like that's what i'm nervous about he says i don't think it's gonna break but <laughs> it's like you know and he's switching to this sled in mcgrath and he did the same thing dallas is doing he didn't dare take it through the mountains Yep. Because for fear, he he want he didn't want to test run it through there. Use old Betsy for that. But then um, now he switches to the light carbon fiber. And maybe Lev had a role in this sled. You know, Lev maybe Lev built Dallas's sled. Um, I I wouldn't be surprised if Lev is behind that sled. And it's uh, probably um, that's a factor. I mean, anywhere you can cut weight, um, the Iditarod and long distance sled dog racing is so far behind the evolution of um what's possible with technology with um like you just have to start looking at other sports and get when you get in close to say downhill ski racing you know i'm here in switzerland this is like the epicenter for i mean uh they're so meticulous you know and the technology and the waxing and all the the weight and um and other sporting events too it's just like if you can trim just a half pound you know 
some mushers cut the end off their toothbrush just to save weight and things like that. But yep. if you can get weight down, I mean, it's only a benefit. So <clears throat> I know that during the season, the race, uh, they were making kind of a big deal because uh, Brent had switched over to a, a Daimler, a Daimler, Dan I don't, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Dan what, Danler. So is that just a lighter kind of style sled or can you talk about that? Okay. Have you, have you heard of a got sled? Hans got like a yes. got sled. That's yep. like Ryan's Ryan's running one. Okay. Hans got and Danler. Uh, I forget. I don't know his first name. He's Austrian as well. Hans is Austrian. If you go way back in time, they're like buddies back in Austria and they had sleds. They, they, that's where their roots come from building dog sleds back there. So Hans went into these distance sleds, but Danler uh, stayed developing these sprint sleds. And they really caught on with the help of the Streepers, uh, Buddy and Terry Streeper, are have for a long time were the reseller for Danler sleds here in North America. So then, before long, everybody's buying a Danler because they fold down, they fit in the dog truck. They, it's basically a cross country ski that attaches a quick attach system to the bottom. I mean, you can pull these things off and wax them just like a ski on the bench. And um, I mean. The steering, I used one, I used a Dandler in the Wyoming stage stop back in 2009 or something. I borrowed one and um, it, it could steer incredibly well. And so Jesse Royer has been using a Dandler in the Iditarod for the first third of the, she always switches at her 24. People don't notice that. Jesse Royer always starts the Iditarod with a Dandler sled. She's been doing it for years. She's been running Dandler in the Iditarod longer than anyone. Uh, there's probably nobody else running Dandler other than Jesse Royer, but she switches in at her 24. Then she goes to the sit down sled. After that, she switches to a got sled because it ha it's just got the sit down spot for the river and the coast and all that. She wants the Dandler for that steerability through the mountains so she can steer around all that windy, crazy trail that you go through in the happy river and through the gorge and all that. She's got such awesome uh, steering capability with that Dandler sled. So Brent Sass gets beat in the, what, Connect 200 by Emily Robinson, and she's using a Dandler, and he's like, then he borrows uh, a sled for the Copper Basin and wins the Copper Basin using a Dandler. Next thing you know, he's got brand new Dandlers on the doorstep, um, you know, and <laughs> Dan, you know, because he's going all in. He's like sold, right? Because right. he felt he felt the difference, and it's – this is a huge topic when we get into plastics and it's something I know a lot about. Um, I'm not the greatest expert, but my, my years racing in Wyoming taught me a lot and we didn't start having real success in Wyoming stage stop until we figured out the waxing and a lot of mushers in Wyoming were ignoring it, blowing it off, didn't think it matters, but like buddy streepers winning all the time because he's winning in, in large part due to the friction on the plastic and this is a whole can of worms to go down like um sprint racers know it i know it i know that i am i didn't do it last year i just ran out of time and energy and i i just did the pink plastic but i've waxed six sets of plastic for the iditarod and because we don't always know the temperature until just close to the race and i make a safe bet on a safe wax I wax six sets of Danler plastic and I have the adapters to go on my aluminum runners. And then I don't start using them till halfway through the race. And then I start putting on Danler plastic for the second half of the Iditarod and they're fully waxed. And I use them for one or two runs and I switch them out. And um, I don't know if it, it's hard to say if it's benefited me or not, but. And there's all sorts has of, a long way. There's all go sorts ahead. of different colors of like Sean, Sean and I have kind of started to talk about this before. And he was saying like, he knows that certain colors are better for certain terrain or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a trust thing too, right? So you're trusting this company 10 squared to produce these plastics. And if they are what they say they are, and then mushers test them out and, give their feedback and it seems to be well dallas when he was winning the iditarod he had green plastic on and next thing you know everybody's running green plastic so <laughs> i mean because it was for the colder temps i don't know but then they they come out with a pink plastic and then now that's caught on and everybody just feels good about the pink if enough mushers are saying the same thing it's partly like it's 
I don't, it's very subjective, but you try to get an overall like understanding. I don't know how to say it. Like if enough people are saying the same thing, then maybe there's some truth to it. And that's kind of how it is with plastic. And it's like, I don't know. UHMW is at the, you know, I don't know. That's a huge rabbit hole to get into and extruded and plastics are, some are waxable, like the Danler type. It's a, you know, and um, others are not. And so when it comes to Iditarod, like who's got time to wax their plastic out there. So you just try to <laughs> go with the best thing that works. And um, yeah, sure. it's pretty crazy. Um, all right. So they, we were somewhere around day one or like into 24 hours into the race and the whole moose thing came up and, you know, we've talked about a, a, a good amount uh, the, over the last few days, but I'm just curious if you've ever had an experience like that either during a race or I would assume you've probably had some run-ins during your training. Um, but you know, it's people are, are discussing the whole, uh, you know, you have to dress it and take care of it, but you're also in a race, but also he had an injured dog that, that happened as a result of it. So I'm just, I would just love to hear your, your, uh, perception of that situation. And then just, if you have any stories that you've experienced. Well, it's go at your own risk. And I know there's been times at the driver's meeting where Mark Norman, the rate, you know, he said, put up your hand if you're planning on carrying you know, to, because this year of any year, you, you might want to think about it. And I'd like to know how many people are planning to protect themselves out there, you know, and probably half the hands go up and there's a lot of mushers that don't, they, they just take their chance and don't. And I, I honestly have been one of those because I come in from out of state and get my hands on a 44 like pistol isn't easy, like to borrow one or whatever. And I mean, handguns aren't even legal in Canada anymore. And, um, yeah, so watching this unfold this year with Dallas and that, I think I'm I, I'm gonna do what I can to make sure I have some sort of uh, defense out there going forward because I think we are playing Russian roulette and it's happened historically. It doesn't happen very often. One, if if you know Aaron Burmeister in 2020 um, between McGrath and Dakotna, this didn't get on the insider. It didn't really get uh, written about. Um, I hot believe take, him, but here, mushing Alaska only right here. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I remember clearly cause Aaron Burmeister told me into cotton, like he was like, like I came up, he came up to a moose in the dark between McGrath into cotton and it wouldn't get off the trail and he's hollering at it, hollering at it. It's got the hook in the dogs are going nuts. And this moose is getting gnarly up in front of the team. It's out there a little ways. He goes up in front of the team and he's waving, but he's got, he's ready to fire and he's ready and he's like hoping to heck this thing just gets off because he doesn't want to have to shoot it and um and then all in one second the dogs pulled the hook and he was just oh. about to shoot and the moose bolted off the trail and disappeared and he grabbed the sled on the way by and that was oh. like you know that story uh no, I, I have no other reason not to believe him. I mean, that's what he told me. And yeah. he told some other people that, but it never really made it into the press or anything. But it was a super close call that could have been the same thing. And yeah, it's like everyone, all of us know it's, uh, you got to um, take care of the moose. Um, we should all have a, a good sharp knife on us uh, for all sorts of reasons, you know? And so, and do what you got to do to, I mean, if you can't get it off the trail, you can't get it off the trail. But I mean, you, you're only one person. It's not like you're going to, if you can't move it off the trail, that's where it's going to stay, but at least get the guts pulled out of it as quick as you can. And most mushers out there have uh, an idea how to do that. I think there's probably some mushers that maybe wouldn't know how to do that, but I yeah. think that's something you should maybe, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, I just heard, you know, Wade talking about it on his episode you know he thinks it would take about 10 minutes if you knew what you were doing um to get yep. that done so and I, I i would agree with that so i you would just get after it i mean you'd be so intense i mean we're competitors i mean this is downtime i mean i make sure the team's tied off good and everything the dogs are secure and i would just go nuts on that thing and like get it done as fast as you can get the axe out do whatever you got to do and just 
like Dell said, he said in the one, he said it wasn't pretty, but he got her done. Like that's all you need to do. Yeah. Get her done. So. Yeah. And so you've never had in a race or in training that experience with wildlife. No, in I've seen moves. I've, I've had a cow calf run in front of me on the Denali highway um, for a long period of time. They wouldn't get off the trail. And that I remember that experience was pretty nerve wracking, but um, they kept stopping in front of me and wouldn't get off, you know, and carrying on and on. But yeah, I, I, I've seen lots of moose in training. Alaska's full of moose. It's like, we, I don't know. We don't see so many moose where I live, but Alaska's just littered with moose. It's incredible. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. That makes more sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the other thing I had written down, I was just curious, it, it, what else is catching your eye, whether it's in the front of the pack or the back of the pack? Um, oh, I think you got a good group at the back end that if they stick together and uh, they dare not isolate themselves off the back and um, they better stick together. Uh, if somebody gets isolated off the back by themselves, they probably end up getting pulled out of the race. But one contrast, like in, in the, you know, when I ran my first Iditarod in the year 2000 with yearlings of Martin Booster, I've told you about that before, you know, so I'm running to Nome with all yearlings and I've got marching orders to take eight hour rest, basically at all the checkpoints, eight hour rest. Well, there was a lot of teams doing that. There was other yearling teams in the race. Jeff King had a yearling team. Doug Swingley had a yearling team. And um, there was other rookie mushers taking that kind of rest. I mean, get to squint and take an eight hour rest. And then, you know, you're taking an eight hour everywhere you go and you're doing like a 12 to 13 day. I did a rod. Um, you know, when I saw Connor take an eight hour rest um, and that really stood out at rainy pass, there's no need for him to take an eight hour rest, but I got to thinking, you know, in the old days, that had been very common for back of the pack teams to take really long rest. But now, um, same thing used to happen in the Yukon Quest thousand mile race. Um, you couldn't pull that off there uh, and try to take those big long rests. You know, the, it's because there'd only be 20 or 30 teams in the race. And then it changes the whole perspective for the volunteers and the race organization and the vet crew. It's like, okay. Like, let's get going here. Like, you don't need to stay this long. Like, get going. But when the Iditarod had, like, 70 teams, you'd have, like, 15 at the back taking these long breaks, and it didn't seem like a problem because it's just there was still a lot. You were safe in numbers. You were safe in the numbers. But as the field is smaller now and you have 38 teams and you, you get at the back and you start pulling those long breaks, you stick out like a sore thumb and you're going to get don't isolate yourself off the back so i that i hope nobody off the back uh, isolates themselves and they stick together and it's as long as they're sticking together then uh the race marshal will leave them alone and let them carry on their way because they actually still are on a good pace they're on a good pace they're fine um yeah so that's you know i've mentioned um what's popping out to me one thing too um you know some of these top teams uh, there's three that I can think of that have kind of combined forces. We think of um, mushers working together. Um, Richie Deal's not in the race this year, and that's a big deal. He would <laughs> sound funny. Eh? Yeah, that's like that's a big deal. Richie Deal. Yeah. So <laughs> you know him and uh, him and Pete are you know they're, it's a they're super in team. the same neighborhood. They are right. And I there there's got to be dogs or Richies on that team. Uh, I don't know. Have you been able to verify that? I haven't, but I, I, Sean and I kind of speculated towards that when, um, when Pete announced that he was racing, but Richie wasn't, I, we were kind of, you know, we were thinking like, I mean, how do you not just combine forces and, you know, they're both at the stage in their career. They've done this long enough. They're ha starting to have kids. They have got other stuff going on. Like maybe one person runs each year, but you still got the combination of both people's dogs so but no i have not i have not been able to verify that yeah it's a pretty safe bet there's probably at least three or four or five of them in there but and then the other combo that people haven't mentioned uh, well wade has admitted it but yeah ryan's got several dogs from wade and his team um so wade wade and ryan are, are go back a long ways they're really close friends and why not and uh so, you know put your four or five best dogs into plug Ryan's team and build in some more depth. Um, so Ryan's got some dogs in there and that's, and, and then 
it's speculative as well. Uh, last time Dallas won the Iditarod on the Gold Loop race, um, he had dogs from Mitch in there too. Yeah. So two separate kennels joined forces to make that like unstoppable team. I don't know if they've done that again this year. And maybe given what Dallas has went through this year, you know, that, and, you know, my heart goes out to them, but, you know, maybe that, maybe there's been some support from Mitch coming in there to fill in those gaps in the team. I wouldn't be surprised, but speculative. And I cannot confirm that. I was just thinking about some of these top teams and how some people are joining, joining forces a little bit and why not. And um, I think that's an interesting dynamic people have overlooked. And and I'm glad that you brought that up. Someone asked a, a question about that the other day that I didn't get to. And they were essentially talking about if you can provide some insight on the like the teams that are head and shoulders, like their budgets are much bigger. The Dallas is the, you know, like the teams that are so well established that they like they don't have to necessarily worry about the funding. They don't have to – they have 80 dogs, 100 dogs in the yard. Like, if you can kind of talk to a little bit about, like, in in some way, those are, like, super teams, right? And then, like, you have, like, this year, 16 rookies. I feel like that's a lot of rookies. But do you think we're going to see a lot of those rookies running the race every single year? M- m- probably not because they don't have their own – you know, so just – kind of talk a little bit give a little perspective on that please well um as long distance mushing more so than the sprint mushing long distance mushing has evolved and a good portion of these mushers are involved in tourism and i have one of that in order to stay in this game you got to evolve and you got to build a viable business um it seemed like years ago it I don't know. There's lots of reasons that play into that. But when you're operating a tourism business, um, there is cash flow and you can divert some of that money into the race and um, you carry a larger pool of dogs because you're running tours. Um, I have no doubt Dallas Seavey's Kennel is operating daily winter dog sledding tours throughout the entirety of this race. So Dallas's company um, could be bringing in money or say um, Sean Williams um you know without at uh the alaska mushing school you know and uh, other people that are running tours and businesses and have set it up in a way and built a good team around them and have the extra dogs and they're they're not losing money by being away for the time that they're at the race and um anyway some some of their mushers that like jeff dieter they have a tourism kennel matt failer does summer tours i don't know if he's doing winter tours or not um he, travis yeah, beals does yeah see so i mean we it's um that plays into so now you have a larger pool of dogs and you have cash flow and then you know these expenses towards the race you know can be written off into the business it's part of it's a business expense to go run the race because you know um that's your whole business is dog sledding and and uh, racing is part of it um so yeah i think go ahead Real quickly, so you're you're talking about some of those folks that you know they have their business. So you're in that category too. Let's talk, and I, and I don't know all the mushers ins and outs, but like when we had Connor on, you know, Sean and 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 I and him kind of were joking like he's balling on a budget, you know, like he does still have it sounds like some tourism coming in to give him some money, but not like not like all these other names that you're mentioning. So can you just talk a little bit about like almost the disadvantage that he's at, you know, like it doesn't sound like he's even got a lot of people helping him do the whole thing. So like that versus a whole well-oiled machine that just kind of pumps itself out. Just kind of talk about that too. Yeah. Well, we each have a choice to make and we have to come to terms with what we want and how we want to do it. Um, You can try to cling on to that, unsustainable model and shoestring it and live in the coal, you know, and, and suffer and train your dogs. And yeah, I'm at one with my dogs, blah, blah. Like it's wonderful. Sounds romantic. Just me and my 20 dogs roughing it. And we're on a shoestring. I mean, it's been done lots in the past, but it's not sustainable at all. And the rubber will meet the road at some point where it will become. And it, I think um, I, I don't, I'm not, I mean, you know, there was a point in my career where I had to make this choice too, where I was living 
and mushing an unsustainable model with dogs. And I had to find a place to live because I didn't have property. And then I had to get involved in tourism. The first time doing tours, I made $500 a day running tours down in Lake Louise. Uh, I've never made this much money in my life. You know, I've worked in construction. I've worked on the dairy farm. I'm like done all this work, but I've never made this kind of money. And I'm making it with my dogs, running my dogs. And it's like a whole new world opened up for me. And it's like, now I get it. I got to, I got to, tourism has to be part of it, you know, in some, in some form in order to make it viable, unless you're independently wealthy. Um, You know, the days of old where you could work a carpentry job, spring, summer, fall, and live in a cabin maybe and save up enough money and maybe go on unemployment for the winter and then work your way through, you know, nickel and dime it through the winter. I mean, you can do it. It's harder now than it used to be. And, um, but at some point it it is unsustainable and it, it, it can't go on forever. So that's my take on it. And Matt's Peterson, you know, um, that guy, he's got a, he's got, a hundred dogs over in Sweden at two different locations running tours the entire time that he's over here. He's built up such a good team of guides and leaders and his family that that business can operate without him for an entire month and a half while he's over here in Alaska training and running the Iditarod. Now there's a smart guy that's got it figured out and he's over here without a stress in the world running his dogs in the Iditarod. And I mean, what a way to have it. That's my I mean, that's, that's the model I'm looking at. Yeah, no, that's, uh, we, he was our last episode before we hit the Iditarod and, um, you know, so he, we recorded a co- a week or two before the Iditarod started. So he's, he was in Alaska and I mean, the guy travels all that way and, you know, they changed the law on him. So he could, he, he initially came over with four dogs a person, but then in February it became, he could only come with two dogs. So he had to get more dogs from other mushers in Alaska. Um, but no, that's just like your perspective on his situation is interesting to me because I was just in my head. I'm like, that just sounds like, you know, I know the financial aspect is already hard enough if you live in Alaska or if you live you know, on the, uh, on the North America side of things, you know, but like he's coming pretty far and, you know, he's, he clearly has a model that works for him. So, um, I'm glad that you were able to kind of provide that, that insight. Um, one thing I wrote down in my notes that we haven't talked about, and I wanted you to kind of provide a little insight on this. Mila was doing really, really well. She was strongly at at the top, and she kind of fell off a little bit. I know that she had two big runs back to back, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what was going on there. Yeah, so I I watched that closely, and it's uh, I almost was going to predict this to happen. If you notice, her and Ryan were toe to toe right from the start, and they chose to run and Hunter did as well, all the way to Squentna off the start. It was pretty safe, six and a half. The trail was fast, and it was not a, not a bad bet. But if you look at the rest, Ryan was clever enough to pack in a little more rest here and there. Millie kept herself to this four-hour like hard line that she wouldn't go over for rest, but still doing the long run, where Ryan would throw in a five-hour or a four-and-a-half, and that makes a big difference. And that's why Ryan has maintained speed, and Millie's dropped off. And now that decision, she she left Rainy Pass and chose not to go through Rome. And she, I, in my opinion, she should have followed the, the path, you know, gone through Rome, get up there to Tin Creek, do a seven-hour run out of Rainy Pass, rest your four hours or, and, you know, and then head on up to Nikolai. And that would have been this. Instead, she stopped at Rome still only did like a four hour rest and then did a huge run up to Nikolai and she lost her speed and she's blaming it on the snow conditions. But if you, if you listen to like Travis, for example, the contrast on the perspective of that snowfall, this like Millie's saying that last 25 miles were really hard. She, you know, slowed the team right down. It was really difficult and lost the speed in her team at that moment. And then you got Travis be like, well, it wasn't a big deal. It didn't really slow down. Like it was just like a nice little fluff on top. Not a big deal. Didn't bother me. And cause he's driving a powerhouse that's fully rested on a good rhythm. Yep. And, and so going back in time for 
if I just, I, I thought back when I saw Millie make that run, I thought back um, from years ago when you were also, and they used to be kennel partners and, and, uh, and Norwegians in general have done, there's been lots of times Norwegians, I don't know why it's more calm. It's not, I shouldn't, I shouldn't just pick on them, but, and I'm not even picking on them because some of them done it like very successfully. Like your has run that run from Rhone to Nikolai straight many times and still come out on top. And so it's been done a lot, but the reason why it didn't work this time for Millie, I think is because her team was already on the edge of rest for the long runs she was doing leading up to that. She had too many long runs leading up to that and added a third, a even bigger one. And it just, so last year's I did her odd, she's she's tough as nails millie and her dogs are tough they're a tough unit and they'll they'll persevere and and she doesn't give an inch but they they did go down into low gear last year her team did they were like they're just in slow gear um for the second half of the race last year and her team wasn't didn't have the speed anymore and unfortunately i think i don't know if she'll get it back after the 24 or not but um, it's doubtful that she, you can already see her trail speed from coming over to McGrath. Um, she's lost that edge that she had and I don't know if she'll get it back or not. And if she does get it back, it won't be for very long before the team goes back down into slow gear again. And she will just grind it out for the rest of the race. Like she's done other years. And that's unfortunately, um, but yeah, I mean, it just goes different for different mushers, different years. It may work. It may not. And she didn't, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's uh i'm not i'm not completely an ex you know there's whenever we have a, a black and we come up with a rule of thumb that we think oh never do that or never do this or always do this always do that like <laughs> a rule of thumb then somebody else just does it and and wins and then breaks open a new oh well i guess that's how we should do it now it's like it's somebody always proves you wrong no matter what like next year somebody will run that run straight and win the race and then everything i'm saying now will sound stupid so Right. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think that from a competitive standpoint that like the co competitive aspect of trying to win the race for her is, is maybe diminishing? Oh yeah. It's gone. You, I think you, it's gone. You, you think like you just flat out, you think she's not yeah. a top contender anymore. No, I think she'll be lucky to be in the top 10. Um, because like I said earlier, you've got Paige and you've got Jeff and you've got Matt Failer in the hunt. And this top 10 is really tight as it is because the quality of teams, I mean, Jesse Holmes always finishes strong. He always seems to figure it out. And um, I mean, I think, I think he'll rally like this little change in schedule he did that maybe wasn't what he wanted to do. I don't think it's going to have his, he's got such a deep team. Look at the, you, Matt Hall is an, another guy that I wanted to point out as well. So for you, uh, followers out there like i was i got to know matt a little bit the last couple of years and I had a beer with him in Knoll last year and uh, if you remember last year matt hall pushed or you know had an amazing finish he came on what was he third last year or third or fourth i think he so. just came yep. flying up and they you know if you catch his interview at the start of this year's race and like he's very confident in that team um last year i left nikolai so the run right that they just did nikolai to mcgrath Matt Hall was pulled over on the side of the trail halfway over and he wasn't, you know, he's always positive, but he was, you know, you could tell it wasn't going good. And he's like, yeah, my main leader just hurt his shoulder and I'm just pulled over for a rest. And I thought, well, he'd had a couple tough races prior to that. Um, but he, he's been slowly building this team and this guy's won the Yukon quest. He used to like peel off 10 hour runs in the Yukon quest, like nothing. He's been running dogs since he could walk. In fact, him and Jesse Holmes run dogs together as kids. Like this guy, watch out for Matt Hall. That's all I'm saying. Because he told me in Nome last year, he's like, "I have a dog team now." They finally became a dog team. In his mind, they had not been yet a dog team, and finally they gelled last year on the Iditarod. So he's coming into this race like, and he just got married. So I mean, he's he's I don't know. I I he's when I won good. the Wyoming stage, <laughs> yeah, he's feeling good. Yeah, <laughs> I think is a he's got lots of energy and he's excited and I think he could win the Iditarod. Yeah, no, I uh, I was super impressed by his closeout last year. He did finish in fourth, and um, I would love to get him on. Um, I'm hoping that we get an opportunity to connect with him after this year's race. 
Um, and so I'm hoping that he can improve upon his, his finish last year. And um, that certainly is a name that I personally am watching that I want to see do well. Um, one thing I wanted to follow up with you on, someone commented that Matt Thaler has a couple of Richie's dogs. That was something they saw on Facebook. And then, oh, okay. And then I wanted to also throw in this question. I think that you know Sarah Dawn, correct? <laughs> she says she's just she was just joining a little late because she was feeding your chickens. <laughs> what is your most memorable part of last year's Iditarod? And did any new dogs take you by surprise? Um. Well, in last year's Iditarod for me, um, we hung in there. Um, it was tough going. I'm just trying to remember Skip. You know, I was so proud of him finishing in lead. Um, the the front end wasn't as strong mentally for me last year as they were the year before, and I had to be a little more. Um, rest in the bank you know we couldn't be in the top 10 and that was out of the cards and we were happy with being 15th and i had also some long yearlings in the team that i had to guard as well and they finished strong there was so i just um yeah a little sneaky was such an awesome dog she she was just so tough and 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 running and wheel most of the race and there was a point during the race where she she started to go lame a little bit and i thought oh no she's hurt herself and then i carried her in the sled for four hours and then I walked her around and she looked okay. And then she rallied. I mean, whatever happened, it was, she got through it, you know? And so, yeah, seeing those young dogs rally through and, and make it to the finish line was really exciting for me. And of course, yeah, the main guys, Wayfinder and, and Skip um, and Junior, these guys up front, we had some really tough wind uh, around Gullivan Bay last year that just about put us to, to the wall, you know, and to our limits of what we could do and i i walked in front of my dogs for five miles on the sea ice you know just with hardly any traction with wearing crampons you know and it was just all we could do to keep going and white mountain was just at the end of the horizon uh you know but it seemed like a, a lifetime away and yeah we made her but so yeah that was last year's i did a rod for me got you yeah i just uh I guess I guess Sarah's watching some chickens for you or something back, <laughs> yeah. back home. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just have a couple things before we wrap up. I was just curious of your opinion on this year's rookie class. Um, if there's anything that you've seen within this race or just in general about the rookies that stood out to you. Well, because of where I'm from in Grand Prairie in my mushing career, I've been able to run some in the lower 48. And um, some of you Alaskans don't really know what goes on down there. And there's some cool races down there. And there's some tough mushers down there. And there's there's the, what well, they got the Eagle Cap in the Utah or Idaho or whatever it is. And, and then the race of this. Yeah. I And then and then the race to the sky. So Jesse Royer kind of dominates down there. But there's, you know, Josie um, Mush down there. I've raced. Uh, uh, near her and Bryce, I've raced with him at the Eagle Cap years ago, and him and his father Rex. I mean, yeah, they're. I'm just so happy to see them make the trip and get up there and run the race. And Josie sounds like you know she worked under Jesse Royer for a while and learned from you know what a better per not a better person to learn from than Jesse Royer. I mean, she's just a complete expert. And um, so yeah, uh, those are a couple of rookies from the lower 48 that I'm excited to to see up. Uh, uh, running the race and um, I think they've got to both have a really bright future in the sport and I hope they make a habit well Bryce you know coming up from lower 48 I, I I hope to see more I hope it inspires more lower 48 mushers to come up and run that's what there used to be more and this is kind of a new a new group Aaron Alt, who I don't know from Minnesota but I've heard her name She's done very well at the Bear Grease and and Bryce and, and Josie just moved right on up. She said, the heck yep. with this, I'm moving up there. So, <laughs> I mean, and um, yeah, and Jesse Royer is kind of that, you know, she's the example down there that they can look to and, and look up to. But yeah, I hope to see more of them come up. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned it a few times for those who've been listening, but Josie really impressed me when we had her on. She just was... Um she doesn't sound like a rookie to me and she's still very young at 30 uh, she's got 20 years of experience and she had a really great season in Alaska leading into the Iditarod. So um, I'll be looking to see how she's doing. 
And um, let's see. The last thing that I was curious about is talk to us about your Iditarod future. Do you have any? Uh, do you have a plan in mind for another Iditarod run? Are you kind of taking it easy? Where are you at in terms of uh, people getting to see you out there on the trail again? Yeah. So um, again, you know, I have. I have a family to take care of and we have, you know, a business at home and then the dog um, tourism business, the dog tours that we're operating in, in outside of Whitehorse, which could only be possible with our kennel partner, Mela Hill. Um, she's been, you might've noticed her competing in the Yukon yeah. quest the last couple of years. And so, um, yeah, Mela has been like family to us and she stayed with us for a couple of years and she does own a group of her own dogs. And, um, it's only right that she gets a crack at, you know, we want to facilitate and help her get to the Iditarod start line. I mean, she's worked her butt off and put in so much, um, into elevation sled dogs. And so I really hope next year that she can come to the start line and, and she'd be a rookie next year. I mean, she's fully qualified and, um, and yeah, we'll see what happens um, beyond that. I mean, the, one of the other reasons we're not there, um, you know, the team kind of aged out. We didn't have enough young dogs coming up into the program. We had some nice young ones, but not enough. And to, I, I want to come back when I, you know, the team is strong enough to have a chance at being in the top 10 and then, and, you know, which could be a couple of years away. And, uh, but I think for Mayla to get a rookie run in with a team that could be top 20 and, and who knows, like, but you know that might be the right combination for her rookie year, and then we'll see what where things go. At. We're breeding some really nice young dogs coming up right now. We've got some, um, yeah. My main leader Eagle, and we're, he's siring a bunch of pups. He's you know we're getting some really tough dogs coming up that are the right type for Iditarod. You know, after so many times in past Iditarods for me, I've had dogs in there that just weren't the right genetics to be in there properly and that's what set me back over the years and i finished with seven dogs or eight dogs instead of finishing with 12 it's like because certain dogs not having the right genetics possibly is part of it and um so yeah we're getting that on track i would say better by breeding exclusively to a dog that you know has shown me what a real i did or a dog should be like a dog that holds his weight has good metabolism is always raring to go even when they're tired and never gets tired. I mean, and, and, you know, that's the kind of dogs we're breeding right now. So there's a, there's a incredible Iditarod team in the ranks coming up in our kennel, but I see Mela getting, you know, the first crack at it before I come back to, uh, hopefully that's how it goes. And, uh, yeah, we'll go from there, but I, I do want to race again, but I need our back to the tourism side of it. For us, you know, we need our, our tourism business to be on solid footing and doing well before we can justify setting that money aside to to run an Iditarod. So we're we're on standby, but we're not we're not done by any means. Okay. Yeah. I mean it sounds like there's the intentions are there to run it again. Circumstances kind of have to, you know, be right for you to do it. You're not just gonna do it to do it. Um it sounds like you wanna run also a competitive race. So, you mm -hmm. know, there's a lot of uh, work there involved to to get a team ready for for a competitive race. So yeah, I'm just I'm just curious. A lot of uh, I know a lot of folks were they had mentioned. Oh, we're sad not to see you in the race this year. So I wanted to ask on on uh, for for their sake. Um, and so before we sign off, this is this is the the final question. I just had had to a have to ask you before we leave. <laughs> Give me your predictions. You know. Um, where where do you think this race is is going at the front and you know if you had to put a a hundred dollar bill on or what what's the currency in switzerland a frank a swiss frank <laughs> all right so 100, yeah yeah 100 swiss hey, worth, frank <laughs> yeah they're worth about the same as a u.s dollar so um so twice as much as a canadian dollar yeah, so that's... yeah if you had, just um let, what are your thoughts on how this thing plays out? I know it's early, but I'm just curious to see what where you think this is headed. Okay, so a lot of people think, oh, yeah, there's a lot of race to go. Okay, things could change drastically with weather circumstances, but typically 
these teams that are at the front are not going to give it up. They're not going to give an inch. And like Jesse Royer has told me, you know, if you're not at the front early on, you ain't getting to the front because they ain't, they're not waiting. And they're so solid up there. Those teams, they will not give up. Like I said earlier, Jesse Holmes always finishes strong. Dallas is not going anywhere. Um, Ryan Reddington just won the race. Pete Kaiser is a former champion and Matt Hall, knows how to close these guys are in the top five and they're not letting go there's too much on the line they, they've they've worked too bloody hard and they've got such incredible dog teams travis beal is interesting because he may have the the strongest team right now and um wade was mentioning that too that you know that team just looked like a solid unit right from the start line and it's it's the best team that travis has ever had and travis has been fifth place before i think if i'm not mistaken and and he does know how to grind it out at the end. I mean, he can go without any sleep. He can. Like, he's, I've seen him on closer to the coat, and he's just like, I can sleep when I'm dead. I'm not, he's not stopping. <laughs> like, he is, he is just, yeah, he gets a little disoriented mentally, even though he's tough as shit, tough as nails. I, I question, even though I'm, I'm, I'm praising Travis and I think he could, he could do it, but, when you put him up against Dallas, it's going to be tough for Travis to beat Dallas when it comes down to it. But unless his team just has this magic carpet ride. So I, it's going to be Pete, Matt Hall, Travis, Dallas, and Jesse Holmes is going to be hanging on the back of that. Although when they come off their 24, Travis will be going through Ofer almost four hours before Jesse comes off his 24. That's quite a bit, but then that 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 levels out later on, depending on the leapfrog, and it may blend back together later on up on the river. So it may not be a complete. Um, yeah, it's they're going to be different schedules going forward. So they're all going to land in Galena probably after Ruby is where you're going to see a lot of them collide again. Nice, awesome. Well, uh, you know we've been on for about an hour forty, and um, I'm very uh, appreciative of the time that you spent with us today. Again, coming to us live from Switzerland. Um, but Aaron, we really appreciate your time. We, I, we, Sean is here in spirit. Like when I say we, yeah. I, I'm also <laughs> like Sean's here. Um, but tomorrow we're excited to have. We'll have Rob Cook on. Uh, so another fellow Canadian or uh, a Canadian resident. And um, we're excited to have him on and get some perspective from him as well. Uh, but for that, I will go ahead and put us over to end the stream, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brandon, for all you do. Take care. All right. Bye.